Welcome back to this new Faith Groups series, Blessed is the One Who Reads the Prophecy, exploring the meaning and message of the book of Revelation. We're here looking out at the site that is planned for Faith Lutheran's new sanctuary. We don't know when that will become a reality, but when it does, it will be here. And you can see that the gardens and the patio are laid out to reflect the layout, possible layout, of the new sanctuary. You can almost picture it, can't you? Even though it's still in the future. There's a sort of present reality to it, even though we know that it is yet to come. Well, the book of Revelation often engages us in a similar look to the future. We have seen that the key issue in Revelation is who is Lord, Jesus Christ or Caesar, the Roman Emperor. And a closely related question to that is then who is worthy of our worship? Because we should worship only the one who truly is Lord. Well, pursuing those questions gives Revelation an alternating character. You have some scenes that depict harsh judgment on sin and idolatry. But interspersed among them are scenes of Jesus' final future victory. It's interesting, though, that these scenes of final victory don't appear only at the end. Instead, they appear frequently throughout the vision. And they serve to relieve the anguish and the despair that comes from the fierce descriptions of the coming judgment on sin and idolatry. And thereby they sustain hope that Christians will be saved in the end. Now in the last session, Pastor Dave led you through Revelation chapter 6. The lamb who was slaughtered opened the seven seals on the scroll. First, the four horsemen brought suffering that's typical of this sinful world. Then with the sixth seal, it set off the final apocalyptic judgment on earth. It portended destruction of the whole earth and all people. And so chapter 6 ends with that haunting question, who is able to stand? And it seems that no one will, especially with one seal yet to open. And it incites tremendous fear about what that seventh seal might unleash. But before that last seal is opened, chapter 7 steps in and reveals who will stand in the end. It jumps ahead to the future to assure both John and his readers of the end of the story. Now it's actually quite a similar picture to what was revealed in Revelation chapter 5 that we looked at a couple sessions ago. And other interludes are sprinkled through Revelation that all have a similar message. So we're going to take a long look at chapter 7 with just a glance at some others to see what the future looks like even when it's not yet here. This vision of the future in Revelation chapter 7 falls into two distinct parts. The first half records a kind of curious census that is actually really significant. John first sees four angels at the four corners of the earth, and they are holding back the winds of destruction. Now, that seems curious because we just read about the destruction of the earth at the end of chapter 6. And this is one example of why Revelation can be so confusing. The book is not an orderly sequence of events. It's much more cyclical or moves in spirals. It's a series of scenes that just serve to reinforce one basic message. So here, chapter 7 jumps back before the sixth seal of the scroll was opened. Now, in your groups, you might want to pause the video for just a moment and reread Revelation chapter 6, 
verses 9 through 11. Now you notice that that fifth seal on the scroll recorded the lament of Christian martyrs who are resting under the altar in heaven. Lord, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? And the answer they receive is, just wait, just rest a little longer, all in good time. Well, the sixth seal then described that total judgment on the inhabitants of the earth for their rebellion against God. So the four winds of chapter 7 are the same as the events of the sixth seal. But before those events begin, God's people will be sealed. They have seals placed on their forehead that shows that they belong to God, and therefore they are protected during these apocalyptic judgments that are unleashed by the sixth seal. Now this is a contrast to the seals on the scroll that unleashed God's judgment as they were opened. These seals protect. There's also a contrast between believers and unbelievers. For those who worship Caesar, their fate is sealed when the sixth seal is open. But the fate of God's people is also sealed by Christ's salvation and the seal on their forehead. The point is that God will not fail to save his people. So even in the midst of all this tribulation that's coming, Christians have no worries. Now from there, the 12 tribes of Israel are counted as having 144,000 members each. And this census has been the subject of all sorts of speculation down through the years. As just one example, the sect called Jehovah's Witnesses originally saw this as a precise number of believers that would be saved in the end until they had more than 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, and then they had to reconfigure it. Many other ideas have been floated about these tribes of 144,000. But in the context of Jewish apocalyptic thinking, the numbers are surely symbolic, not precise. It's not an exact count of anyone, but rather 12 by 12, 144, multiplied by 10 by 10 by 10, 1,000, equals all of God's people. Both 144 and 1,000 are numbers of totality, completeness, fullness. Moreover, by naming them for the tribes of Israel, it ties this final future vision to the promises that God had made long ago to Israel. It reminds us that Jesus fulfilled the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament. He didn't reject them. And so this census of all the people in heaven envisions the entirety of God's people in his kingdom. That then carries over to the second part of the vision in Revelation 7. And again, you might want to pause the video for just a moment to read through Revelation 7, 9 through 17. Now this great multitude that John sees is the same group as the 144,000. And yet, John says, after this I looked and saw the great multitude. So what's the difference? between the 144,000, the totality of God's followers, and the great multitude from every tribe and language and people? Well, very likely it pictures the church before and after the last day. The sealing of the 144,000 comes before the last day and shields God's people from the coming judgments. The great multitude singing God's praises in heaven shows eternal salvation beyond all threats and judgment. That's all been completed. 
And this distinction is indicated by some of the details in the text. For example, back in verse 4, it says John heard the number. But in verse 9, he saw the great multitude. What was only told or predicted before is now envisioned and seen. Also in this second half, as the great white-robed throng waves their palm branches and shouts their praises, those were typical signs of victory in the ancient world. And so they indicate that Christ has triumphed finally and fully over all the powers of evil. Also, we know in the ancient world that it was very rare for anyone to have clean clothes on. But victorious generals would always wear gleaming white robes as a sign of their victory. And so as this throng is dressed in white robes, it's a sign that they too are victorious in Christ over sin, death, and condemnation. So in chapter 7, the first half equips Christians to endure by putting God's seal on them to protect them. The second half shows the eternal victory of God and the Lamb. Another way to describe this same distinction between the 144,000 and the great throng has sometimes been called the church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant, think military, is duking it out in this sinful world. That's why the 144,000 need to be sealed by God. And note, back in verse 3, it says they're still on the earth. So this includes all Christians living in the midst of this sinful, broken world, and that includes us, you and me. But then starting in verse 9, we see a picture of the church triumphant. Not only the 144,000, but all believers who are saved in Christ. And it's a vision of beyond the struggles of this world to the eternal future that God has promised us. And so in thinking of this distinction, Gerhard Krodel writes, salvation is more than just deliverance from diverse evils. It's also wholeness of life in God's presence and participation in his life and reign. And that's the future that is promised to us. Well, that promised future makes Revelation 7, 9 through 17, an achingly beautiful picture of the future that is ours in Christ Jesus. First, note that the great multitude gathered around the throne in heaven cries out that God and the Lamb are victorious. This, again, is the great question that drives Revelation. Who actually is Lord? Well, here, well ahead of time, we know the answer. God wins in the end. Then, in verse 11, all the heavenly creatures join in the singing, much as they did back in Revelation chapter 4. They begin with the word Amen, which means, yes, it shall be so. That affirms the praises that were sung in verse 10. But then note that the song goes on to name seven blessings on God. Again, in the Bible, like 12 and like a thousand, seven indicates fullness, completeness, totality. So this is total praise. All glory, all attributes belong to God. And then at the end, there's a matching amen to affirm that those blessings, in fact, are true. Those are the attributes of God. Then in verse 13, we find a feature that's typical of this kind of apocalyptic writing. The person who's receiving the vision asks for an explanation. because He doesn't know exactly what's going on. And so John asks, who are these? Now often in apocalyptic writing, this is where some secret knowledge is given to the person who receives the vision. 
And very often that person is told to keep that knowledge secret for a certain length of time, but not here. Here, John gets the whole story, and so do we. Now, as the elder explains to John what's going on, note how he identifies this great white-robed throne. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. Well, what is the great tribulation? I mean, it likely refers to the judgment that was unleashed by the sixth seal at the end of chapter 6. But of course, these were sealed by God, and so they endured all of that suffering. But beyond that includes all the ways that the world fights against Christ and his church, and the suffering that results from that. And so it's important to see here that God's seal protects Christians through suffering, but it doesn't spare us from suffering. In fact, Revelation would indicate that we actually should expect that as Christians in this world. But the last day will mean no more suffering, no more tribulations ever at all. And so this description of the throng is coming, uh, those who have come out of the great tribulation, is a call for Christians to endure in faith in Christ no matter what. And then the elder says that this great throng washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. Hey, think about it. That's a really weird image. Blood doesn't make anything white. It stains it. And it's one of the hardest stains to get out. Now, this is, of course, familiar language to Christians, but we maybe forget that it only makes sense in light of the Bible in light of the message of Revelation. We are forgiven, we're cleansed from sin, only because the Lamb of God was slaughtered. Just as he appeared back when John first saw the Lamb in chapter 5. I mean, that makes no sense to the world, but it's the heart of the gospel. But still note in that description from the elder that the subject of the sentences in verse 14 is they. They washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. I mean, the blood of the lamb is the only means of salvation. But the gift is given only to those who stick with the lamb. Again, faithfulness to Christ in the face of competing claims and persecution and suffering is the dominating issue in Revelation. And here in the midst of this glorious vision, John's readers are reminded again of how crucial it is not to give up, but to hang in there and to stick with Christ Jesus. And then finally, a cascade of promises rolls down to replace the cascade of threats that filled chapter 6 as the seals were opened. Verses 15 and through 17 take us back to the throne room of heaven that John saw in chapters 4 and 5. Now the language of the song that is sung here mostly comes directly out of the prophets in the Old Testament. And that again ties the gospel to that whole story of God working through Israel. I mean, his promises, even if long delayed, will be fulfilled. We can count on even in the midst of the insecurity of this world. And note specifically that verse 15 promises that the one seated on the throne will shelter his people. It's quite a sharp contrast to the end of chapter 6, where people were seeking shelter in caves and wherever they could get away from all the destruction. Now, the Lamb will shelter them because the lamb is their shepherd. But again, what an unusual image. Normally, lambs need a shepherd. They don't serve as one. But in the Old Testament, a shepherd 
is an image of a good, faithful king. Like we read in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, Jesus is that good shepherd, just as he claimed for himself in John chapter 10. And so we know that the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, will shelter us through all eternity. And then finally, note that the text switches to future tense, starting in verse 15. God will, will, will. Well, on the one hand, that acknowledges that this is a future view. Christians are still being persecuted. John's readers are still suffering. This is not yet reality. We're looking out to a promised future. But that future tense, even in the vision, also says these promises will go on and on and on and on for all eternity. God will never stop doing these things that he promises for his people. So this is a glorious vision of an everlasting future ensured by Christ that comes up front, ahead of time, when we can envision it even though it's not yet fulfilled. Well, now besides Revelation chapter 7, there are other future glimpses in the book, as I noted earlier. We've already seen how Revelation chapters 4 and 5 are similar to what we uh, read in chapter 7. But again, in the second half of chapter 11, you find a scene of final victory, including some uh, verses that inspired some of the lyrics to the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Chapter 19, again, is a scene of God's final victory with more of the lyrics of the Hallelujah Chorus. And then the final vision of God's future victory comes in chapters 21 and 22 to close out the revelation. Well, we'll end this study with those chapters in session 7. Before that, however, Session 6 will help you to unpack some of the strange symbols and images that fill this book called Revelation. So for now, just revel in the glorious scenes of our certain future in Christ and enjoy your discussion of them in your small group.